Okay, folks, good evening. We'll make a start. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the sixth Northern Ireland Sheep Programme virtual event. Unfortunately, we are still unable to hold these events on farm due to the ongoing pandemic. My name is Hannah McNeilis, and I am a Beef and Sheep Advisor here at Caffrey, and I will be your chair for tonight. Please be aware that you may experience connectivity problems from time to time due to your broadband speed. The event is being recorded and the link will be made available on the CAFRI TV YouTube channel, where you'll also find the previous five Northern Irish Sheep Program events. Tonight we have two presentations, after which we will have questions. Please submit your questions throughout the event. Laptop users can submit questions using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And mobile users can also access the Q&A option via the three dot icon, which appears when you tap your screen. We would ask that if you're asking questions through the Q&A icon, that you select all panelists and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can at the end. Your feedback is very valuable to us also and a short survey will be available at the end of the event. And I'll provide further details of this later. Now I'd like to welcome our four panel speakers. We have Sam and White, Caffrey Beef Sheep Advisor and the Northern Irish Sheep Program Manager. Roy and Marilyn Mares from Tempo County Fermanagh, they're Northern Irish Sheep Program participant farmers. Kieran Maley, from De who is the Deputy Northern Editor of the Irish Farmers Journal. And we also have Dr. Eileen McCluskey, Caffrey Sheep Technologist. In addition to this, we also have Rachel McGarl, Gareth Beacon, and Henry Salmon from Caffrey, who are providing technical IT support throughout the event. This is now the sixth Northern Irish Sheep Programme event. The previous events focused on grassland management, finishing lambs, breeding for performance, OPA, and preparation for lambing. The recordings of all these previous events are available on the CAFRI TV YouTube channel. I would also like to add at this point, during Senan's talk with Roy and Marlon, if you would like to enlarge your screen, you can do so by clicking expand view or full screen on the bottom right hand side of your screen. So to introduce our panel tonight, Roy and Marilyn Mayers are lowland sheep farmers from Tempo and County Fermanagh. Roy and Marilyn are going to provide us with a background to their sheep enterprise and will highlight some of the practices that they undertake in relation to maximising lamb performance from grass and in particular their paddock grazing system. Dr Eileen McCluskey, Caffrey's te uh, sheep technologist, is going to provide us with a performance update from the Caffrey sheep flocks. In addition, Eileen is also going to provide an insight into the management practices undertaken on the Caffrey farms to maximise grass utilisation and to highlight some of the benefits of performance recording. Kieran Maley is with us tonight and filling in for Darren Carty for this evening. And Kieran will be available on the panel to answer any questions that you may have in relation to the Northern Irish Sheep Programme as one of the project partners. So at this stage, Senan, I'm going to hand over to yourself, Roy and Marlon. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you very much. Um, they, good evening, everyone, and hope you're all safe and well. Um, so the weather's not really playing ball with us at the minute, and we're talking about grass tonight, but uh, <clears throat> hopefully we'll uh, pick up some things that uh, Roy and Marlon are doing that hopefully we'll look forward when the weather does return to someone uh, uh, sort of normal. Um, as I say, folks, uh, Roy and Marlon will be chatting to very shortly. Um, I'll be doing a short video um, showing it towards the end, then there'll be a few more wee slides. And then I say, as Hannah said, we'll be handing over to Eileen from a uh, Calfrey Suspector from the Beef and Sheep Centre. And Eileen also will have a short video. So there'll be a wee bit of changing with the videos as well. So, folks, as I say, one of the major focus points of the programme is, as the title says, grazing performance uh, and proven performance through grazing management. Uh, there is a huge range, obviously, of grass growth across farms. Um, and this is a big, will be a big focus in the programme this year. Uh, the farmers will be measuring and seeing how the improvement in grass growth can can occur. So that's one of the major reasons that we're covering this tonight. Um, 
obviously the starting point is obviously you want to find out where you're at at the start and how do you do that well measuring is a big part of that there so that's the first thing we want to do and then from that there you decide well uh, do we reseed do improve infrastructure or whatever so one of the, the a, a very pleasing advocate um of the program or from the program has been roy and marlon who have really taken this on board um and it's just this point i would like to introduce our hosts this evening and i'd like to thank them very much for uh, agreeing to uh, come on here tonight so Roy, I think maybe you're going to kick off with a bit of an introduction of who all we see here. Uh, yeah, um, this is the team here. Um, uh, on the right hand side of the picture, that's my daughter Tanya, and uh, she's studying biomedical engineering. Um, it's his first year, so um, she's been off quite a bit with COVID, so she's been helping out on the farm. She will be the main person for recording the information um, through the EID, recording it onto AgriWeb. Uh, next to her is my wife, Marlon. She's the person that actually runs the sheep enterprise, the day-to-day -day run of it. Um, and myself in the middle, I'm out working most of the time, so I would just be there to do the um, tractor work and do things like that that have to be done. So, and then next uh, to that's um, my son, Ashley. He's a qualified electrician, and he would generally help out again with uh, recording and also any repairs and stuff like that need to be done on the farm. And on the, the left-hand side of the picture, that's my younger son, and Gavin, 13, and um, he's helped out a good bit around Lamont time as well, doing the single pens and doing whatever needs to be done around the sheep house. So we all have sort of worked together as a team, and that's what it's all about. Excellent. Yeah, that's just one of the points. Like, no matter what you know, um, people say and things you can do, things you can't do, you know, labour is a big thing, and obviously you've been very, you know, you're very fortunate you have uh, the family help there to to um, to do that. And as I say, we will be talking to Marlon as well. So as you say, Marlon is the head of the sheep outfit. Roy does the uh, some of the other work, but yes, it is a team. So I will be speaking to both Roy and Marlon throughout the uh, event. So basically, Roy, the first wee bit here, but just give us a. I say we'd love to be out in the farm. Uh, I lucky lucky enough to get back out again there a couple of weeks ago. Um, so maybe you just go through, Roy. What's what's the setup? Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm uh, working all the time and then part time farming, and it's basically just family help. Um, we don't employ anybody else. So the block's made up basically at the end with um, 200 joes and 70 hoggets. And, um, a well, a small cattle rearing enterprise as well, where we buy in uh, dairy bred calves and rear them through the beef. But we have been sort of maybe scaling that back a bit and increasing the sheep numbers. Um, the land sort of is in one block and it's all um, SDA land. Um, that's the, basically the, the farm highlighted there. And uh, we actually purchased this farm back in 2000. Um, our home farm is situated just to the south of the factory, the farm yards actually, um, just for tenants putting the wee icon there now. And um, we have been taking over part of the home farm. My father was farming up until about um two to three years ago and still small and small scale so we've been taking over more of the home farm ground but it all basically is in a block of about um 180 acres in total including woodland etc but it's all very compact with um main ways and whatever it's say uh, leaves it easier to manage yeah. i'll say when we're out roy there we just decided to take this photograph so that's the that's the main yard here roy with the sheds yeah. and, and then yeah. this would be looking back down at it a bit uh, it's, it's, it is heavy land and it's um, got up to 600 feet, so it's, it's fairly high up as well. And it does take a reasonable bit of management to you know, keep it in production and um, keep the rushes in their place. Uh, um, this bit in the, in the sort of major part of the picture here would have actually been part of the ground that my father was farming. And he farmed in a very extensive way, didn't really use fertilizer or anything. And um, we've been trying to bring that into more productive um, bases, which you can see sort of in the middle of the picture there um, with reseeding and you know, better management, um, we've been able to improve it quite significantly. Yeah, no, it, it is a credit to you, Roy, because I say that is, it's, you know, well, to say you're down as a lowland, it is SDA land, and it, it is difficult, so it is a credit to the both of you for what you have done uh, over the last while and, and continuing to do it. So basically then, Roy, we've come on maybe a bit about, about the sheep enterprise itself, what, maybe you tell us a bit about it? Um, well, we've been traditionally using Texel and Suffolk, uh, basically crossing back and forward between those two. Um, we did use Baltex for a number of years as well, but we found them a little difficult to finish. Um, and we've also um, been moving more towards a grass-based system, so I think that maybe they would suit more intensive type system 
which we would have been doing ourselves in the past. Um, we would traditionally keep our own replacements. Um, this year we would have had about 50, we'd have kept up our own, and then we also as uh, we'd have bought in um, some Bell Clare replacements as well, half bed Bell Clares, which we bought direct from a farm. Um, we also purchased a New Zealand Suffolk ram and a Bell Clare ram. With the New Zealand Suffolk, we reckon probably would be more suited towards our grass based system because the rams themselves wouldn't have had, wouldn't have been fed any meaning. So we reckon that would probably suit our system best when we're moving towards a grass based system. And we use the Bell Clare basically as a maternal to improve our lambing percentage. Um, all our sheep are lambed indoors and we have used existing housing which has been converted um, and we're basically more or less at our peak as regards housing at the minute for about around about 300 is what we, we have space for. Um, we would lamb them in batches so that we have them near the house whenever it comes towards lambing time just for handiness really. Uh, so basically a grass-based system is really what you're moving to towards yeah. so you know basically you want to have grass for them so that's why the whole measuring thing is important that as soon as they're lambed and they're fit enough and big enough and mothered well enough they're back they're out again as soon as you can onto that system to keep the keep the cost down so that's yeah, very yeah. Commitment. yeah. so right so maybe going to the next bit roy obviously i said with all the program farmers like we've sat down i suppose it's over two years ago or near enough two years ago roy um Unfortunately, we haven't been out on farm as much, but we sat down and we had a fairly frank and uh, honest conversation. And I say I have to commend everybody within the, the program that has done that because, you know, this is where I would encourage any farmer to think and see where what they want to do over the next period of time. Um, these were some of the goals, just some of them, Roy, that are maybe Marlon, you want to come in here, uh, some of the things that um, we discussed over the period of time. So what, what have, how have you come on with these uh, folks or anything done a wee bit quicker or? As much as a big thing, we, we did try and improve our lambing percentage, and that is why we introduced the bell clare into it. Um, uh, that has been successful, and our lambing percentage has improved quite significantly. And um, in the little picture that you see there, that's actually quite a few pet lambs. We sold off quite a lot this year as well, um, which is pet lambs. So our lambing percentage has improved, um, I'd say, probably up to close to where we would like it to be. And um, we did introduce the paddock grazing system probably about three years ago, and we've extended that now um, throughout the whole farm. So it's something that has allowed us to, you know, basically uh, maximise the grass that we have, and also that we can know what grass we have and we can budget better and, and make the use we have. And what yeah, we have, the is, numbers um, right, like already, we have yeah. increased. We have increased the numbers, um, but we would have been over sort of around 180 to 200 yards, and we're up to near enough 300 now. But our limiting factor really at the minute would be housing. If, um, we, would, we wouldn't be able to increase the numbers anymore unless we spent quite a lot of money on housing. So we'll have to yeah. make some decisions on that if we were to increase. Yeah, no, fair enough. And I say there's other options for other people, you know, like there is, you know, remember saying in your situation, but, you know, possibly some consider as outdoor lambing or something like that maybe down the line you know it's something to something to look at for all farms so um you know adapt uh, as as things go on so excellent rise i say things to go on folks things come a wee bit earlier things uh progress quicker um and it's been very pleasing to see that you know those what we thought was maybe four years right it's, it's definitely cut down and maybe the five-year one you're nearly there which is is, is really commendable uh, to you so uh, folks uh, what we'll here again is is a wee target uh, table that we've done and obviously hopefully if any of you's tuned in before you will see that um there are 2020 figures roy and basically a target um obviously we'll have the scanner figures as well which were quite you know they were well up there when we're weaning that you know the scanner would be would be above that as well so um you're weaning roy you're near maybe marna coming in here like yeah. you're happy with what you're what you're doing yeah we're glad to have the increase up to 1.89 there now at weaning um i'm aware that it's taken a struggle to get to that figure, but it's also going to take a struggle to keep it there. Yeah, and we yeah. have had a fairly rigorous culling policy over probably the last few years too, and that has sort of helped that, you know, we've been uh, any you know, that would have had a single like three years ago would have automatically go even to no other fault. So things like that, you know, factors like that can obviously 
you know, takes a while for that to come through, but it does uh, have an effect. And hopefully, from, if we can maintain the figures that we have at the minute, that's uh, probably as good as we want to have. Yeah, no, definitely. As I say, like the fat lambs, obviously, we wanted to get a few more. Obviously, the prices last year, Roy, it helped everybody. There's no, there's no question with that. Um, yeah. the old numbers we've said uh, the were two hundred. You're at end towards the three, and the last two are the real uh, impressive figures. And yes, you know, people say, yeah, well, as I say, prices were good. However, like it's not just all about price. You know, efficiencies were were achieved. Um, your figure 2019, Roy, I think was about 55 or something out there. So, you know, it just didn't all jump in the back of price. Um, mm -hmm. It was a credit, you know, to the hard work he's put in um, and getting more lambs out the gate, um, you know, meeting that weight um, that, that we required. So definitely it was something a credit to use. The gross margin there, Roy, again, uh, 565, hoping to push that up a wee bit more. Well, hopefully like one of the, it's most the big factors we had in, we would have traditionally been meal feeding the oats at grass and we'd also been creek feeding lambs. And um, by cutting that out, like that was 21 pound basically between um, 2019 and 2020. And um, so that obviously improved our gross margin per yo. And also um, our gross margin per hectare has improved quite a lot as well. We made, we've been doing quite a bit of reseeding and also the paddock raising has come into play there as well. You know, we've been maximizing what we can get from the land that we have. Yeah, well, that's uh, exactly. Just bought in feed as much as we can. Like, uh, I think it would have even had a bigger knock on effect um, this year with the price of feed this year. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, like, it is. It, it's it's taken work from both of you and the, and the and the children as well. So it just doesn't happen overnight. And I say it is. It is a credit that you have done that so far. Um, so I say what we have here. I'm just going to briefly go through these, and then I'll. Well, there's a few wee photographs here. I just want to maybe illustrate it a bit better. Um, obviously lambs uh, all tied to birth and EID recording, and you've brought in the AgriWeb uh, system. And um, maybe when, when we get on to the next bit, maybe we can explain that a wee bit with Marlon. The grass and improvement focus, obviously. Um, We've talked about the paddocks and also all the soil has been sampled uh, throughout the farm. And then, as with everybody else in the program, we've sat down and had a very rigorous um, health plan and a very honest conversation with your vet. And I think that's paid dividends as well. So maybe just on those on the EID and possibly the animal health, Marlon, maybe you could, this is your AgriWeb page, maybe you could just tell us what we see here or what are some of the things you bring out or what are some of the things you look at. Well, initially, when we talked about the idea at first, I felt a bit reluctant. Um, I was concerned that young lambs, that two tags was going to be a little bit severe on them. Um, I also was concerned about the little ears festering, but um, I dip each tag in iodine before we tag, so thankfully it hasn't been an issue. Um, I'm very glad for the advantage of EID um, for a number of reasons. Initially, I suppose it's easier to monitor RAM proliferacy. Um, just for example, this year there was one RAM we weren't really that um, we thought wasn't that good, but whenever it came to lambing and we realized um, and checked the figures, um, he was doing a lot better than we were giving him credit for. So we'll not be calling him this year. Um, also, for the ease of management for the lamb growth rate, um, we have a target for each lamb at eight weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks, and so on. And um, if the lamb doesn't meet the target, well, the yo is called to believe that the growth rate of the lamb is very dependent on the mother's milking ability and also um, the mothering ability. So it's because of the ID, it's easy to keep track of each lamb as an individual. Um, also, mm -hmm. when it comes to keeping your lambs replacements, um, we can just check through the sheet and keep the top performers um, for replacements, as opposed to ones that just look pretty. Yep. No, you know, the figures. Yeah, make, makes all the difference, yep. Um, and just, just to maybe bring on, Marlon, uh, just on the health plan, does anything come out of it? Any, absolutely. Anything? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we were very glad that we were encouraged to do a health plan. Um, I suppose, and whenever I spoke to you first, Senan, we talked about maybe things we weren't just that happy about. 
One, for example, was um, we come to the end of lambing and while there was some yo scanned in lamb, um, they, came, they were empty when it come to actually lambing. Um, it was just a few, happened every year, so we didn't really pass much remarks, but you drew our attention that there's a reason for everything. So um, then we were in touch and we worked closely with our local vet and we got the blood samples and there was a lot higher reading of enzootic and toxoplasmosis abortion in the flock than we realized. Um, it didn't, we didn't really think it was there because we didn't have a barren, high barren rate, but um, it was there. So we were glad to find out the reason. So um, in August 20, then we went in and um, done all the yo's and yo lambs with um, vaccination for the abortion. So we're glad to be aware of that. Um, I suppose another thing that drew our attention and the advantage of EID was um, for the last number of years, in the month of July, I noticed that lambs weren't thriving as good as I would have liked them to have thrived. But um, I didn't maybe have enough confidence in my own opinion to say there's an issue here, there's a problem here. But um, whenever this year, or sorry, I should say last year, when the lambs were tagged um, and they were weighed, well, whenever we weighed them, we could see in black and white that in the month of July, they weren't thriving as they should. So we got some advice and it revealed that we had a cobalt deficiency. So um, we feel that um, there was a lack of thrive. Um, so now we have, um, we're going to drench, we drench them once a month then once we're aware of the problem. So all being well this year, we will, um, bolus the lambs. So hopefully that will get more lambs away fat and finished right. as opposed to um, selling them as stores. Yep. That's to say, that's that's the point that you need a measure to manage and you know that's what you were doing and I say it's, it's a credit to you for doing that. So thank you very much Marlon on that. Uh, maybe Roy just bring you briefly here the soil say with the soil sample and then the um some of the things we see here. So what 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 well, I see um, here our ground would be quite um PD type ground so um pH level would be quite low on a lot of our land and we had all the farm sampled last year and the year before so um, we are putting on um, two to three tonne of lime on, on those fields that um, particularly around sort of 5.6 to 5.8 to try and sort of get it up to 6, 6.2 um, and we've also been doing quite a lot of raising and using um, uh, Quite a bit of clover in this ward as well. We're trying to move towards clover based wards and trying to reduce our fertilizer inputs quite significantly. And the slide on the right that Senan took the picture off here, that deck only gets one bag of super start in the springtime and the rest of the year it performs okay, basically because there's clover, sufficient clover in that sward to um, put the nitrogen into it so that you don't have to use any artificial fertilizer on it at all and it does perform. Very well without anything yeah. else. So we try and move towards that again to reduce um, costs on the farm. Yeah, I, I just hear Roy Case Anyway thinks that's a weed. Um, just in the middle here, Roy. Maybe you could tell us if we, in the middle of the. Hopefully people would see that there. That's yeah, chicory, well, Roy. If I remember. Yeah, we we would um, include chicory in January when we're reseeding as well. It's uh, a natural and fermentic, so you know it doesn't cost that much to put it in and. It will last probably about three or four years in this ward as well. And the sheep are um, graze it well as well. They're quite fond of it. So it doesn't cost too much to put it in. And um, it seems to help a bit. I mean, if there's some good, it's worth putting it in. And um, okay. we certainly encourage people to put it in to, um, when you're doing a reseed. It's, it seems to work well for us anyway, even in heavy ground. Okay, so we made a, made a few questions. A bit of interest in that there has been gained mm -hmm. over the last period of time. Um, mm -hmm. Just the next one, I'll, I'll just go through these and then I'll say we'll have a, a couple of photographs to illustrate it better. Like you've been in the EFS scheme, Roy, uh, for a few years now, and obviously um, that is, you know, yeah, well, we sustainability is important as well, you know. We, sorry, we went through the countryside management scheme and then we had done our term on that. So the environmental farming scheme um, came along last year and we, um, done quite a bit of work on that through um, hedgerows and also um, water troughs as well and fencing off drains etc. So um, those schemes have been useful and particularly the hedge, hedges as well because um, a lot of our farm didn't really have good hedges and 
good hedges or good shelter for, for the sheep. So we certainly would um we maximized what we could get out of those schemes when they were going. Um and on the right again, that's um we do uh, use the plate meter to measure grass growth as well and try and keep them um top of the words that we have and also allows us to budget what grass we have ahead and um hopefully we can maximize what we can get from grass. Yeah, yep. that's that's the big that's the big story. So, mm-hmm. Riley, we've got a, a very nice background to your farm. Now we're getting down to a wee bit more of the practicalities so what we're talking about this evening. So, I've just done a couple of slides here, Roy. Um, how to set up paddocks that people might think that's very basic, very simple, but it does need a bit of thought about it, Roy. Um, maybe you just talk through here. We'll have a, a couple of things here. So you just chat through, Roy. What what do you do? And then say we'll have a wee video of it being practically done. Um, the things that you've found work and don't work, Roy. So maybe just chat through that. Well, as far as we are concerned, like we we started off on a small scale first, maybe only done a couple of fields and just to see how we'd get on with it. Um, probably about three years ago, and we um rolled that out to. All the farm last year, and we've seen them again now this year. Um, we sort of wanted to build our confidence with it that it would work for us, and also it was important that it worked and that we didn't have issues with the sheep running through the, the wire. So, um, it is important to make sure that it's um, done right at the start of the year that the ewes and the lambs, you know, that their fence is working properly and that they're, they're not going to get through because if they get a habit, yeah, everybody knows what will happen next. To, yeah, they're really hard to get stopped. Um, it's best to sort of keep your keep your paddocks simple and you know look at your feeds carefully first and divide them in such a way that you know you can get in and out easily to the fields as well. It, it's easy to to work from one field to another. Um, and as I say, you definitely don't want don't take it on in a big way. Take it on small way first and get familiar with it, and then um, extend that then over the farm then. Um, yep. We we certainly try to have it simple that if you go in once try to the field that you can move around the paddocks without having to go through a paddock that's already used. Or you know, so it, it it's it takes a bit of planning, but certainly it works well. And yeah. at least then every two to three days then sheep are getting into um fresh grass and we you know try and I mean, maybe at the minute there's not as much grass as we'd like. We're probably having to move them maybe a little bit quicker and move it other ways like to do, but at least we can see what's ahead of us, and they're still getting moved into fresh grass every two to three days. Um, yep, yep. And hopefully, in three weeks' time, the growth will have improved enough that we can catch up a bit. As I say, Roy, that's one of the things uh, you, the last point you've, you've mentioned very well, you know, ideally three leaves in the grass, three days to graze, and three weeks to rest it. Um, mm-hmm. Now's the time when grass is maybe restricted, is the, be- the time to really. You need to know your game and to know where you're at and to know what grass you have in front of you, because then you can make those decisions um, as if and when it comes ahead. So, folks, thank you very much for that. We I'm just going to stop sharing this wee bit here, and then I'm going to bring up the wee video uh, that um, I uh, filmed when I was out with Roy and Martin there a couple of weeks ago. That's basically uh, a six-acre field is divided into three paddocks. Um, the paddock there, I'm measuring, is the one that they actually moved out of. Uh, it would have been sort of like a day and a half, two days prior to that, um, being measured. So, um, it basically, uh, I think that Senan sort of has a, a measurement there. Hopefully, if it comes our length, but, and then um, there's sort of you can see the difference in the amount of grass that there is then from that field onto the next field. So we're able to keep a track on what grass we have ahead of the sheep as well. And um, that's them in the sort of a, a day and a half into that paddock. And um, then there's another paddock in the, the right-hand side of the picture, which is moving towards now, which is going to be moving on to next. So at least there, we, we know exactly what we have and we can move them ahead and they're getting fresh grass in um, every sort of three days there as well. So it's leaves it that hopefully we can maximize the performance of the lambs from grass. Like they're getting absolutely no supplements whatsoever of grass. They're just grass-based and and um, they seem to be performing well and getting their first way this Saturday, so we know what's happening. And as I say, Roy, like this is showing a big, fairly big field that you've split up, and they say just three strands of wire, Roy, and it seems to work fairly well. Oh, yeah, the, the, if you providing that the fence is working correctly right to the end of the fence, um, three strands is adequate to keep them where and the sheep there that 
wouldn't have been used to a pencil and it definitely works okay but it is vitally important that it's working and working all the way through to the end yep and as i say like when when you're like this is what i will say we photograph of this at the very end here um like you're you're looking for where you've gone where you're at at the minute and then on to the next the next paddock which is hopefully this this type of grass here right i hope that's what everybody's seeing yeah well that's that's the our plan anyway is to ha always have you know fresh leafy grass in front of them and keep them moving you know so that they're always getting fresh grass um and hopefully we can maximize the performance of sheep by doing that you know they're not sort of just grazing over the whole field we they're directly moving into fresh grass every two or three days yeah yeah um and it is you know it, it is something right you've been you know you've been going at and like this field here as you say we've probably been cut for a while or some of it right but you know at least you have the option now to get more out of it um you know there's bits you can cut bits you can't cut and then you've access bales well then that's all the better now that's it and as well as that like in, by grazing out those paddocks we um we haven't we didn't top any at all last year and we certainly um it allows us to keep on top of the grass and there's no grass basically being wasted yeah so maybe marlon this is a bit where the, the practical stuff comes in maybe you could tell me what roy's doing here yeah well roy is putting in the posts um at 10 meters apart we find that 10 meters is sufficient if you go further apart the wires and inclined to sag um of course with the exception if you have uneven ground if there's a hollow well you have to have more posts because the wire will end up too high and an animal get the bad habit of um going underneath um he's also alternating them uh, in the event of the sheep maybe getting a fright and rushing against the wire that it would come off the post halfway down the field if they're all turned the same direction yeah so basically like, like i think we're coming here now it seems to be a wee bit slow here this for some reason but the um like you're putting on three three rolls marl and that's generally or has that always been the number you have two here now but i think you're coming back up with the third one that's right well um initially last year i felt a bit nervous so we actually put up four and it worked very well but we thought we'd just try and see would three work so we just used three this year and thankfully it has been sufficient and have you ever had lambs going underneath them or you know is that something you've thought of marlin or you know lambs going ahead or maybe that bit later on well if you're just careful that there's no hollows in the ground that the wire is low enough and um, just checking there to make sure that um there isn't any hollows or spaces that the lamb will go underneath um you need to have them high enough as well of course because you could get an odd mule that could jump so it's just yeah. kind of getting it right and that's the most important part here Marla. like this you're set up a battery the the energizer and you're testing it which is the most important thing to make sure it's right working yeah that's right if it's if it's um if it's not working it's you're, the you need to test it right to the very end because maybe an odd time you'd have a break in the wire that you'd hardly notice um i suppose if the wire while the wire is new it wouldn't be an issue but um if the wire was getting old or a break in it then you'd be in trouble if the electric didn't go to the end yeah, yeah. yeah. and i think one of the things martin we've discussed like you know you're bringing them in fairly regular you know you're moving them so you are seeing them you know a lot more regular possibly than you were before and you can you can issues you could find out if there's anything wrong with them or you know whatever and i think on this day morning you did find a couple of lambs you weren't just overly happy with so the paddocks has helped you with the handling and the, and the actual husbandry that's right well the more you handle the sheep the easier it is um they would almost know when you want to move them and you call them and they generally come and um, so they're running through the yard regularly so it's easier just to or when you're moving paddocks you can just bring them in so you can check over for any issues that you're not just happy about maybe one that's not driving well enough that you can bring it back and keep it in uh, as i call a special care unit yeah um, and that they can give better attention if there's something that they're just not happy about i would say that's your double tags there marlin no problem with them at all as you said like you dip them in iodine and you have no issue and then you're finding all the information that you need to that's right that's right that's right yeah no i was concerned as i said about 
festering, but thankfully, um, no, there was no need really. And I'm happy to continue to EID at birth. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So I think now we're coming on here. We just basically see the, these were right back into this paddock here that has been um, just been freshly the fence put up again. Um, and we'll show hopefully now in a wee minute, basically a better level to give you a better uh, understanding of the level of grass here. And it's hopefully that shows you uh, what they're actually going into. So that's really the, the whole point of the paddock is you're going into fresh grass. You know, they could turn that, the oats turn that into milk and the lambs are eating more. Obviously, they turn that into, into meat, um, the cheapest source of growth that we can have. Um, so that's really the, the point of it, on um, fresh grass as much as possible. Um, we're also then, Roy, I think we're coming on to this. The next wee part here is um, some of the fields that you've reseeded um, mm -hmm. up in the, the higher bit. So I basically you can say, you know, you can do paddocks anywhere, Roy. Uh, well, uh, basically that, that field was reseeded in 2019. It would have been reclaimed from mountain in the... 80, so it's um, up well, it's probably about say about 600 feet, and um, with that divided again, it's into about two and a half acre paddocks there. And the sheep actually moved into that just um, day before yesterday again, so it's getting now its second run round for the year. And um, it's, it seems um, it's established well, and there's and plenty of uh, uh, perennial ryegrass in it, um, and again, it's clover based sward, so we're hoping to. Maximize what we can get for the least cost. And this is the last point, Roy. We just want to bring. This is the shifting, um, or maybe yeah. more. Just how how do you do it, or how do you shift from one product to the next? Well, that's basically uh, moving them from one to the other. That's um, two of our children, and um, we just basically call the sheep, and two of us would lift the pants up high enough, and they all just come running along straight underneath, and we can change a the batch there as well, roughly about seven deals plus their lambs. Takes less than half a minute to move them from one paddock to the next. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, excellent. There's been thankfully no issues with them going underneath it or anything. You know that that system has worked well for us. Yeah, you, you need a couple of them to come to help, but it's quick and handy, and you don't have to bring them out of the field. Very good. Very good. right, folks. Thank you very much. That's that wee video, um, and we'll go back now just to finish off uh, this wee section, and. Hopefully we'll get back to that again. Yeah, hopefully everybody can see that. That you can see that, okay, Roy? Yeah, yeah, that's okay, folks. Just a couple of wee bits. So that was the palette. So this is just a couple of wee points I want to reiterate. Um, is you know the power is very important uh, daily. If you had me into electric, that would be the best you get. However, you know battery power as well as the battery charged up and as, as Martin's demonstrating here, make sure that the power is going through the line um, because they want to get a habit or if they got a habit back again, you certainly are into a bit of a problem. Um, and this folks, I just want to bring this photograph back up because this kind of epitomizes the where you want to be. The, the paddock on your left obviously is grazed out and some nice regrowth coming. The paddock they're in, they're in it for a wee while more and then they're going into fresh leafy grass again. And that's the whole point of a paddock system. They're always going to fresh grass and they'll know they'll want to get into it as well. So folks, that's basically that wee bit. So just uh, the last wee bit here before uh, I hand over to Aileen. So for Roy and Mar Marin and the, and the family, what what's the future? What are you going to do with the farm or what things do you want to look at? Well, our plan is to maximise what we can get from grass. Basically, home produced grass is the cheapest feed that we have. So, if we can maximise that, hopefully, we'll maximise the profitability that we can have from the farm. And the AED system this year would certainly be looking at um, a policy of looking at growth rates in lambs and selecting our replacements from the best performing ewes that we have. Um, and um, we have selected rams from based on EBVs and it's something we'd certainly be looking at in the future when we purchase and um, mm. hopefully if we need to purchase a RAM this year, we'll certainly be trying to get a RAM with uh, figures behind them and trying basically to maintain what we have as regards the, the, the lamb and percentage. Um, we need to keep that where it is and it certainly won't happen if we don't uh, work at it. Like we we'll certainly need to try and keep those numbers up till where we're targeting or 1.9 is our target and hopefully we can keep it up that and also obviously have we need to keep on top of that like with uh, vaccinating and um, also uh, keeping on top of any mineral deficiencies because we, we know now we have a cobalt deficiency we need to address that in time and hopefully we can get our lambs away 
quicker and get more lambs through to the, the factory rather than having to sell in the stores. Excellent. Very good. Very good. Folks, thank you very much, Roy and Marnon. You should have a have a rest now. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, folks, just while I'm uh, finishing up here now, I'll be handing over to Aileen. If you people have any questions, you know, for Roy and Marnon, obviously would ask you now, it would be a good time, you know, to, to put them in. I think the questions are coming in now. So hopefully, folks, that's my wee bit for now. So uh, hand over to Aileen. So thank you very much. Performance that the Roy and Marlon are getting off grass. You're you're doing a great job. I've got a hard act to follow here. I think, um, <laughs> as Senan um, as Senan had mentioned, I'm just going to um, sort of give a bit of an overview in relation to what we're doing at Caffrey. Um, like um, Roy and Marlon, we run an apatic type system. So really, what I want to cover tonight is a wee bit of an overview um, of what we're going to do. I, I want to mentioned just a wee touch on our first rotation we've, we've already sort of been through that and i know it's come and gone but i think it's important to highlight it um because it has a big impact i suppose on your grazing season going forward chat a wee bit about our grazing management where we're at now mid-season right through to weaning a bit of management post weaning and as um senator and hannah had mentioned already as well we want to talk about the data that we're collecting the monitoring and the measuring we're doing because that's that's critical to the, to the whole system so a lot of you will be very familiar with the sheep system that we have at um, CAFRI. It's a 200 ewe system. Um, we are working with a clean cross ewe that is bred at the hill farm um, outside or at Glenwary. And all the ewes are made until a meat link gram. And the emphasis here is 100% fat lamb finished off grass. And that's that's what we're striving for. And that's what we're and that's what we're working towards. So maybe just um, to sort of maybe highlight and get put it into perspective, really the area that we work with. Um, as I said, we are working with 200, 200 ewe flock. You know, those numbers fluctuate sort of year on year, but th that sort of figure of 200. Um, if you look at the top of the screen, this is obviously um, an area of grazing at the Beef and Sheep Centre. Along the top of the screen, you will see um, seven paddocks, one, two, three, four, five, six highlighted in red. This is the area that we um, use for our paddock grazing system. Now this total area is just under 12 hectares, um, seven paddocks, a city around about 200 ewes, very high stocking rate. We're sort of sitting in around there about 16 ewes per hectare. Um, each of these paddocks you'll see sort of slightly different sizes range from just under two hectares to just about, about one hectare. It's also very important to highlight that this is the area that's dedicated to ewes post lambing right through to weaning and managing those ewes and lambs post weaning. The ewes do not be here over the winter. They're grazed on a slightly different area of the farm. And that's really been, that's really important in relation to building up um, building up our grass wedge to begin the grazing season. So I'm just going to actually start a small video here. So if you just bear with me till I get it up and up and running. But the screen that you'll actually see here um, will actually, it, it, it's an overview of the, the paddock system that we have. So. Where, what you'll see here at the bottom of the screen is actually the start of our grazing paddocks. As it is a seven paddock rotation, you'll maybe see some of them in the distance. But this first one we see with the trees is paddock one. Slightly later grass color paddock two. We can see slightly darker grass here, paddock three, four, five. And, and as we go on, and we'll go over the top of them. This video would have been taken about two weeks ago. So mid-April time. And at this point, we had sort of almost grazed. We had sort of grazed over all the seven paddocks. So a bit of... um background as to how we manage them. The ewes lamb begin lambing mid-March and they lamb quite tightly, you know, within about three weeks. As they lamb, the ewes are, are, are housed three weeks prior to lambing. The twins were housed this year three weeks prior to lambing and the singles and the triplets were only housed a week prior to lambing. As they lamb down, the lamb and shed is relatively close to the paddocks. As they lamb down, you know, like everywhere else, we put them into small sort of batches into, into the separate paddocks. And the aim is to spread the ewes out over all the paddocks to get them all grazed down. Um, and, we'll, and we'll graze the paddocks quite tight at this stage. We'll graze them down, you know, you know, about three and a half sort of centimetres to really, you know, that's like 1,200 kilograms of dry matter. You know, that's what we're leaving behind to really try and clean out all that sort of, you know, old material that had been carried over the winter. Um, once we sort of sort of get a week on, over our belt and a couple of weeks over our belt, what we'll start to do is we'll start to bunch the lambs up. And you'll see actually from the video that two of the paddocks have sheep in them and the other paddocks don't. And you'll see obviously from the color of the paddocks that they have been grazed down. And why we start to do this, that it's important, although it's important to graze over the whole area, it's also really important to start trying to bunch those ewes up and trying to get ourselves into that rotation. Because 
We know that grass will bounce back after a tight graze and then a rest. But if we have still spread all the ewes over all the paddocks, um, and, and that's that's a common thing that we'll do because we feel like young lambs and ewes, they need loads of space. They'll mother up better. And we do give them that space initially. But once we feel they're that we're a bit older, we start to bounce them up and then we start to give paddocks a complete rest to try and bring them back into rotation. So you've seen here now, we're just going over along to the very end to paddock and um, paddock seven. It's massively beneficial. You'll see that we're lucky enough to have a laneway that runs the whole way along the, the paddocks. And this is very beneficial because this aids movement. Um, if, if, for example, it, it's beneficial if you can move, ideally, if you can go paddock one, two, three, four, five, but life never works out like that. And if we needed, for example, to go from paddock four to two, we can take them out onto the laneway. I also want to just highlight to the right hand, to my left hand side here, this is a part area we call upper park. It's closed off for grazing, but that is an area that we can utilize, you know, um, sort of at the end, post, you know, sort of towards the end of the season, post weaning, or if needed it for lambs or for yews. So you'll see here now we're going back across, and I want to just highlight this paddock that we're just sort of hovering over at the minute. That is paddock number three, and that was the first paddock to actually the yews sort of about a week or ten days after this video was taken, the yews were sort of bunched up and they went into paddock three. As, and that's where our sort of mob began. So that's why it's important to have some empty paddocks because we need to sort of get into that grazing rotation. So ideally, um, by the end of by the end of April, we've done our first rotation, we've cleaned out our paddocks, we've bunched up our ewes to actually get us to that position where we can then start to we can start to manage and we can actually start to go through our rotations. Um, I highlighted, I just mentioned that you know the, the ewes lamb down in, in the 17th of March. They're housed for a very, very short period of time. The ewes obviously will get supplementary feeding at that stage. As the, the twins were fed this year for about three weeks and the singles and triplets after that. But once they hit the grass, that's it. They don't get any creep feed. There's no concentrates offered to any of the ewes or lambs at, at grazing time. The ewe, the lambs are all EID tagged at birth, and um, any any additional information that's required. The weight will be, you know, we know who the mother is, and the birth weight will be recorded. And like I said, any other additional information. They're tail ducked, um, and out they go. And you know, it's really where we, you know, we're starting to kick off with grass growth. Um, we do start to measure grass sort of mid February. This is important, you know, this year especially, we probably, you know, we wouldn't have been seeing a lot of grass growth there, but we do need to establish um, what the covers are, how much grass we actually have on board. I mentioned that the ewes did not graze in this area over the winter. This probably would have been closed off, you know, toward, sort of like mid-October last year. And that was essential to build up the bulk of grass that we needed. There's 200 ewes going out here. They're eating two and a half kilograms of dry matter a day. You know, th that's 500 kilograms of dry matter a day that was required. So we had to build up a good sort of bulk of grass to, to get us to this um, stage. This is um, Lindsay, one of the guys in the farm. He was um, recording grass measuring and said this started in the middle of February and it continues um, weekly. All the information that is collected, all the covers for each of the paddocks is entered into um, AgriNet, a grass monitoring and measuring program. And we'll, um, we'll chat about that. Um, we'll chat about that just later on through. So as I said, the paddocks are walked, um, the paddocks are, are walked weekly and all the grass measurements um, have, all the grass measurements are inputted into that. So just folks, bear with me because the video is coming to an end. So I'm just going to exit out of that and go back until our presentation. OK, folks, so that was to try and sort of give you a feel for what we have done. That was management practices that we have sort of been doing from mid February, mid March through to really the beginning of May. So now I would say where we are, you know, it doesn't feel like Lowen's that over, but I would say we're already hitting that sort of mid season management of grass because once we get to May, I should say, usually when we get to May, we're starting to see, you know, peak grass growth, you know, a real jump in, in production. And it's all about managing that and, and ensuring that we're making the best of that. This year, we're probably finding that, well, you, you know, grass growth isn't where it should be. And we're still, you know, where maybe some people are struggling a wee bit for grass, but we still need to manage it. There still is good quality grass out there. So we still need to make sure that we're getting the best of it. So, you know, ideally here, key is maximizing performance of direct from grass. And as I said, there, there's no meal offered here. There's no concentrate offered here. And it really is, as simple as you know quality versus quantity there's nothing better than driving past a field full of grass and seeing the young lambs sitting in it and thinking oh my goodness that's amazing there's a loads of lush grass in front of them but we have to be realistic when we get to this time of the year fresh leafy grass can turn to very stemmy undigestible you know product quite quickly when it starts to you know starts to seed and goes to head and that's not going to be nutritional that's not really what we want to put in front of animals we want to offer them this very short dense leafy grass you know it's got a high nutritional value and that's required because you know we're at a stage now where you know there, there's lambs and there's lambs there you know 
potentially six weeks of age, and another few weeks time we're going to be going from six to eight weeks of age. The, the 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 growth from milk is starting to drop off. You know that sort of peaks at about six weeks. From here on onwards, we're going to be seeing the demand for growth from lambs from grass. So we have to be make sure that we're actually going to be meeting that, and we're putting the right the right product in front of them to, so so they can meet that demand. So. Ensuring that we actually um, put good quality um, voids in front of them, it's very much about understanding your plant. And I just want to maybe just run over this because, um, you know, we do feel like you see a large, you know, large leafy grass. We feel like that's the best for them. But I suppose it's maybe if we if we understand the concept of the way, you know, the grass plant itself. And if you look just to the right hand side of me, um, you'll see, you know, our, our, our grass plant, a three leaf plant. OK, this is when we're at our peak nutritional sort of quality. Um, once a, a fourth leaf starts to come, the first leaf starts to die. And this is where we also, you know, talk about utilization. We know grass is the cheapest form of nutrition that we have on our farm, but it's by no means free. It's still a cost and we have to ensure that we utilize it. Um, we know there's a, a, a large variation in what farmers can grow on farm. You know, anything from, you know, five ton, 10 ton, 12 ton. But we also know that there's a wide range of how well that's utilized and we have to try and utilize it. I said earlier on, you know, we've got a rise in demand for grass. We're in a very, very tight year for grass growth. So we have to make sure that we utilize what we grow. So this is where we get, this is where we get, the, you know, the sort of the ethos and the thinking around this in at a certain height and out at a certain height. Because if we look at back at our grass plant, at about sort of six, in around six to eight centimeters, it's just at that ideal, nice nutritional leafy stage. Once it starts to get higher than that, this old leaf has got stemmy, it starts to drop off. So we've grown something and we haven't eaten it. So we've got poor utilization. Um, so we've lost, we've lost a bit of utilization and we're also getting sort of stemmy. So once it gets to about six to eight centimeters, we wanna be in there and we wanna be grazing it down. Post um, grazing height is also extremely important because the age old saying it takes grass to grow grass is very, very important. Yes, we want to graze obviously a component of that plant, but we still want to leave enough behind to utilize, um, you know, to, to photosynthesize and actually grow. If we grow that plant down too low, yes, it will still grow, but it almost has to use energy to repair and that slows the growth process down. So really, you know, this is why we have these key, this is why we have these key, um, you know, heights. Graze at six to eight because it's bang on, you know, good nutritional plant and graze down to four because we've utilized the best part of the plant, but we've left enough for regrowth. So, you know, the whole concept of it to maximize growth is keep keep your sheep and lambs moving through your paddocks, get them grazed over, get them grazed all over nice, short, quickly, um, and then get them moved on. It's important then to highlight at this point. Well, you know, so what if it goes above eight or ten? You know, does it really matter? Um, well, really, yes, because we have lost a, we've lost a plant plant matter starting to die. So we've lost nutritional value that we could eat. Um, the plant starts to obviously get you know less um, less nutritional, more lower digestibility. So we would say if you're getting to paddocks and they're getting you know very high, obviously for sheep here, if they're getting very high, you know, above eight to ten centimeters, um, we would say conserve that paddock if you feel that you are fit to take that paddock out of your rotation. And if you can, um, if you can manage going past that. And this is where the tools and the technology comes in. And this is how really you can benefit from this. Um, we've said we can't manage what we don't measure. And that is extremely important here with grass. There's a number of ways to measure grass. Um, we are using here on the right hand side, you'll see a rise in plate meter, which basically you, um, and, and we've seen the farm, we've seen Lindsay earlier on using the plate meter walking across the pasture, but really the rise in plate meter, it, it measures the height and the density of the grass and then gives us a figure of what's available there. But there are other options out there, you, a sword stick, um, a welly boot, and some of those that are very good with it, you know, your eyeball and get in, your, get in and have a look at your, um, and paddocks and, and sort of see the covers. We also um, use a grass uh, measuring and sort of budgeting program at the farm and it's called AgriNet. And this is really beneficial because we can put all our paddocks that we use into the program. We can put all the, the livestock that actually graze those different paddocks. So I will know the demand for grass on each of my individual paddocks or in my individual fields on the farm. And then I can put my weekly covers in or my weekly you know, cover of grasses in those fields. And what it will do for me is it will produce a grass, a graph, and it will tell me, OK, so what are my weekly covers? So you can see here um, we have got the, the different paddocks that we have. Um, SMP, we, we call the sheep grazing area Seven Mile Park, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six A and six B because we, we originated six and we split it to seven. 
So we can very quickly see um, the covers that we had and we can see the demand line. So you can see here, okay, um, paddock number three, and that would have been the dark green one that we would have saw when we were going across. It's, you know, the user, the, the user lambs are in this. It was sort of getting to that stage where we needed to be grazing it down. Um, you know, if this, if this was sort of like, if this was a, a good year and there was a lot of, you know, grass growth was where, what it, where it was at, we would possibly say until ourselves, Maybe we need to take that paddock out, um, but we were conscious that grass growth was that wee bit slower this year. So really, we can see here, okay, our paddocks are coming up to our demand line. So we're reasonably, we're, we're where we want to be. We have that wee bit of surplus in the bank and we have a few grazing days ahead. If I was seeing all my bars below this line, then I would be worrying because I'd be thinking, okay, my paddocks are never going to reach my demand line. But also, likewise, if my bars were all very far above this line, I'd be saying, okay, I, I have surplus grass there. I need to manage my surplus grass. Um, I will start to take X, Y, you know, different paddocks out of here. And it's also beneficial. Okay, I know paddock three, that's where my ewes are at. I know the next paddock coming up there is paddock 6B. So that will most likely be the paddock that I will move my ewes into. Um, so it's just something to help you predict grass growth. Um, and obviously it takes into consideration what the current, you know, the grass growing conditions are. So it, it's a very beneficial um, and, and useful tool. So moving on, I suppose, um, and I should say, you know, we're working with a seven paddock, um, seven paddock rotation. So really, ideally, what we're trying to do there is, you know, this the golden rule: three days in, um, and, and three weeks out. And um, so we're three days in each paddock, uh, seven, you know, and it's twenty-one days really before we're back to where back to where we started. And really, you know, across the season, we'll be trying to do, we'll be trying to get that rotation, you know, in sort of six or seven times around the rotation. So I know it sort of maybe feels that we're jumping on a wee bit here, but really then we got to think about management and post weaning. And if the year continues the way it is, and I suppose grass growth continues the way it is, this is something that'll possibly come to play, you know, a lot earlier than what we think. We normally wean the lamb sort of, I don't know, average sort of, you know, 13 to 14 weeks old, but really it, it can be anything from 10 to, to 14 weeks of age. Um, the lambs are normally weaned sort of around, in, in around mid July, as I said, about at about 13 weeks of age. Um, however, if if grass growth is tight um, and we find that we're having a difficult year, um, it, it's definitely good practice to go in there and win those lambs a wee bit earlier. Don't be afraid to win lambs a wee bit earlier. As I said, lambs will have had their sort of peak milk. You know, they'll have you know over 50% of the milk they'll drink in their lifetime by six weeks of age. After that, the milk that they're getting for their mother is dwindling and the energy and, and the growth that they're getting from grass is rising sort of very dramatically. So if grass is starting to get tight, go in there and wean early. Because the most important thing post weaning is that we now focus on putting the best quality grass in front of those lambs. They're the lamb, they're the they're the animal, the livestock on the farm that actually need it. So we continue with our same paddock rotation. We continue with our same pre and post grazing heights, going in at you know sort of six to eight and coming we're going in at eight and coming out at four. But we work it slightly differently and that we will put the lambs in first. We'll let the lambs graze from eight down to six, so they get that real high, nutritious, lush, dense grass, and then we'll move them on, and then we'll bring the ewes in behind them, and we'll use the ewes to graze it down to four. And really what we're doing there is we're always offering lambs the best quality grass all the time, and we're taking the ewes in to ensure that they clean it out and graze it down good and tight to re encourage that regrowth as we move on. And I said, this is what we will, this is the routine that we'll work with post weaning. If we start to feel as we get towards the end of the season that we're not getting enough grass, um, you know, we might take the ewes out of the system and possibly put their, them somewhere else. But normally it'll work, you know, this will still work quite well um, as we move throughout the season. But definitely, please bear in mind, if grass growth is tight, wean the lambs and offer the lambs, offer the lambs the grass. So I just wanted to maybe throw another option out there because I, I, I am conscious it can be, you know, it it's, can be difficult sometimes, I suppose, to get your head around how many paddocks should I have? How many paddocks should I have a yo for particular yo's? We, as I said, our paddock rotation, it's a seven paddock rotation, three days in, you know, sort of a three weeks to their back in again. Um, but we're working with a very, very high um, stocking rate. But a good sort of train of thought, and this is one that should have like a, a, an example that's widely used. But if you have 100 geo flock, for example, 10 euros per hectare, four euros per acre, which was, you know, achievable and a reasonably good grass based type system. So basically what you're taking your um, your 10 hectares and you split them into five, five paddocks. So you've got two hectare paddocks and this is, you know, a good sort of size of paddock to run your ewes through at the shoulders of the year, early on in the spring and late on in the summer. But then we would say to actually improve performance in this, um, split those 10 paddocks up. And Roy and Marlon did a great job there of showing how permanent fencing and then the temporary fencing to actually split those down. 
So if we kind of maybe put this in context, um, I've got five paddocks. These will be my temporary, you know, you can see paddock one, two, three, four, and five here in the white. They will be my permanent fenced paddocks and I can move my sheep through them. And then once we get to that peak season, May and June, I could use temporary fencing to split these down and try and improve utilization of my utilization of my grass. So just another example. You know, it's not, there's no necessarily rule, set rule that fits here. It's what's better suitable for your system. You know, I could have four and eight, I can have five and 10. It's really about finding what actually works well for the system that you're in. So it comes back to um, measuring. We did say we cannot measure what we, we don't, we can't manage what we don't measure. And that's extremely true. And we've talked a lot about, you know, ensuring that we've got good quality grass, ensuring that we're putting the best quality grass in front of our animals. But how do we actually know, apart from walking through the fields and saying, okay, that's extremely good lush grass. It looks good. I'm doing a great job here. How do we actually know that we're doing a good job? How do we know that we're putting the right quality of feed in front of our animals? And how do we know that we're getting our appropriate growth rates? And I'm just going to play a, just a short video here and hopefully technology works for me and it all goes OK. Um, I'll just put the sound down, sorry. But this is just an example of um, Wayne at, at, the, or at the Abbey here. So I've said, and we talk a lot about this, we talk about measuring your performance. We've talked about measuring your grass, whether that be with a sword stick or a plate meter and using your AgriNet program. But measuring the performance of your lambs is equally as important, if not more important, because we're, we're, we're having all these plans for grass to get the, you know, to get that performance out of our lambs. So we have to measure. I said we birth recorded, we birth um, record all our lambs, we EID them at birth and we know their birth weight. We will then monitor their performance through recording their weights at various points throughout the year. And it's important to note that this is something that we do alongside our husbandry practices. So whenever our lambs are in for their white drench um, the start of next week or in for a heptavac pee or if the ewes are in for shearing, for example, we will actually run the lambs over the weighbridge and we'll collect a weight. And that's vitally important because we we have targets for grass growth, but we also have targets for lamb growth. So we have set ourselves a target. We, you know, it's a good lowland system. You know, we want to try and push lambs as quickly off grass as we possibly can. And we have a target here about 300 grams a day. That is the performance that we expect to get out of our lambs because we hope that we've selected the best genetics. We put the best nutrition in front of them and that's what we're hoping to get. And we really, you know, we monitor this through regular way in. So the smaller picture on the screen here to my left hand side, apologies, you can't actually see this didn't really come out that well. But, you know, the animal will go on the way bridge. The data will be collected in the handheld. And this handheld will tell me all the previous widths for the animal for that particular lamb. It will also then tell me weight gain between the, the current, the most recent and the last weight. And that's vitally important because that will very quickly flag up to me. Oh, there's a lamb. It's only doing, you know, 100 grams a day or it hasn't put on any weight since it was last in. And that flags up issues. So that will then start to tell me, right, my lambs aren't make, they're not meeting their targets. So why are they not meeting their targets? It's going to be two things. It's going to be nutrition. It's going to be health. We've talked quite a bit about nutrition and how we get the best grass in front of them. So if I feel like I'm doing a good job of grass, you know, I'm getting that part right and my lambs are still not meeting their targets, then that will make me question, is it a health issue? Is there something else, you know, is there something underlying here? And I know we have sort of mentioned, obviously, you know, how nutri important nutrition is, but I just want to go through some of our targets and then maybe just touch slightly on that health issue. So performance at grass, you know, that's that's what we're aiming for. We set ourselves targets. We want to meet them. And I was asked maybe to give a bit of an overview as to, you know, what is the performance of the lambs at the Abbey or, and how well are they doing? We set ourselves a target of a kilogram of lamb produced per kilogram of ewe mated. And really what that means is our ewes on farm, an average mature weight of 70 kilograms, we expect her to be weaning two lambs at 35 kilograms each. Now that is a tough ask to be fair, and our average wean weight is probably sitting closer to about 32, 33 kilograms. So we haven't just hit that target yet, but um, you know that's what it's there for. But we also monitor weight at different times throughout the year, and that's important, obviously, to highlight how good a job we're doing with growth. But it also, you know, it's very important to to highlight the performance of the ewes because we can have a great grassland management system, but if the animals that we put in that system aren't the best animals to utilize it and perform on it, you know, then you know we're not going to achieve those targets. So we monitor um, growth for the first, you know, sort of six to eight weeks. The, tar the average, this, weight, this sort of six to eight weeks would have been taken last year and the average lamb age was 43 days. Um, 
particularly younger than her eight week weight. But this is really important because this is a very, very clear indication to the ewe's milking ability. Up and at this stage, the lamb weight, I would say, is a clear indication to how, how good a job mommy's doing there and how much milk she has. And at this point in time last year, at average 43 days of age, our lambs were doing 335 days or 335 grams off grass. Now, there'll be a big range there. There'll be lambs doing, you know, 450. There'll be lambs doing 200. But across the board, you know, that's where we were at. And, and we're happy with that. Um, but if we think back to this time last year, it was a very, very different scenario. And, and the weather was very different and the grass growth was very different. But we were very much where we wanted to be on target. We then look at where we are from birth to weaning. Um, and I said, you know, sort of this average, you know, this magic figure, you know, sort of in between sort of like 12 to 14, to, um, to 14 weeks. Our average, you know, weaning, this was taken last year, average um, age of the lambs was 92 days. And the lambs were sitting at 285 grams a day. And that's fine. I know I said my target was 300, but I'm not, you know, we're, we're happy with that. We're, we're on target. We're, we're, you know, we're happy with where we're, we're at at that particular point in time. Again, there'll be a big range. There'll be lambs, you know, doing you know, a lot closer to four, you know, 400, 450, and there'll be lambs doing a lot lower than that. We then take that right through to slaughter um, because that's important too, because that gives me a bit of indication to, you know, how well we've managed them across across the system. And, you know, uh, the slaughter date last year, average days to slaughter was 152 days for the lambs that we had on farm. Again, there'll be a big range. There's lambs gone off farm at 85 days of age, and there's lambs, you know, that are, that are pushing it close to 300 days, you know, towards the end. So there's a big range in there. Um, but our average um, daily labor again from birth to slaughter was 278. Um, and that's something we're pleased with. If I, I look at if I look at daily labor again, which I haven't put up there and I probably should, because it's things something people will be interested in. Average daily labor again from weaning to slaughter was probably sitting at about 187, 197. So you can see how important that good growth at the start of the year is to actually, you know, keeping those lambs on target and getting them off farm on time. Pre-slaughter weight, um, the lamb average, you know, pre-slaughter weight was just under 45 kilos or 46 kilos. Carcass weight 21.8, you know, very happy with that. That was average across the board. We're very conscious, well, we're conscientious. We still probably give away a few, two extra kilos there, but you know we're reasonably where we want to be from your 21 and a half, and our kill out percentage was 48 percent. So the performance did really well last year. Going where grass growth is at now, if it continues, you know I don't know if you know we'll possibly struggle to meet those targets, but um, you know hopefully we'll keep on board. So maybe just to come back to the last point that I had made, you know. We're, mo measure we're monitoring the performance of our ewes, making sure we've got the right type of animal to, you know, to perform at grass. We're managing their grass really well to make sure we've got the best nutrition in front of them. But if there's poor health, all those things sort of go down the pan, you know, that's not going to work for us. So this time of year, and we're, this really should be, if it's not in your mind, it should be now. We really need to focus on this and think about this as parasite burdens. It's, it has a major, major, major impact on um, lamb growth and performance and potential. Um, we already see there's sort of forecast and that is forecast in relation to, you know, nematodirus. So please do, you know, sort of start thinking about this. But all too often we think, OK, lambs have got a, a, you know, a burden of worms. I'll give them a drench. They're cleared out. Happy days on they go. You know, they're back to they're back into full swing again. But it's really important to highlight, you know, if a lamb has a lamb obviously won't perform well with a worm burden. But if a lamb has had a very heavy worm burden, um, even if we drench it, what is the likelihood that that lamb's cleared out 100%? Possibly not, you know, it's, it's unlikely. There might still be a, a proportion of worms left, but there also is a legacy there. There probably has been damage done that will find, that, so that lamb will find it very, very difficult to get back to its 100% performance, its 100% ability to perform off grass. So worms can have a very sort of like, a very sort of like long lasting effect. And maybe to put this in context, if we lost 20 grams a day, you know, over the lifetime of a lamb from worm burdens, we're adding on the best part, you know, of an extra sort of, you know, sort of week or so. Um, I think it's about six days it adds on to days to slaughter. And if I was to lose 50 grams a day, you know, over the lifetime of that lamb due to poor health, worm burdens, infection, I'm adding on the best part of, you know, almost three to four weeks days to slaughter. So that has a big impact on, on my purse. You know, those lambs are eating grass that they shouldn't be. So we need to move off. So I just want to bring your attention to um, 
The logo on the top right hand corner, SCOPS, Sustainable Control of Parasite and Sheep. It's an excellent website. They have brilliant information about managing parasites, internal and external parasites, about the appropriate use of drenches, you know, making sure we're targeting the right drenches because we also have to be very aware here. We have to be responsible in how we use these products. We want to make sure that we safeguard them and they're there because we can't manage parasites without them, but we also have to use them responsibly. So there's excellent data on there to say, you know, how you should manage them how I can prevent or reduce worm burdens and ensure that I select the right product. And a tool that we use on the farm, um, and some of you will be very, very aware of it, and, and especially BDG members, hopefully you'll have come across this, but it's the fecal egg counting or FEC pack. And really what we're doing here is we're monitoring um, worm eggs in the dung, and that gives us an indication of worm burdens within within our sheep and within our lambs. And we have started this. The first dung sample was actually lifted today, and we will start this, and we'll do this almost sort of you know every two weeks as we go through the as we go through the grazing season. And this is really it's a tool. You know, it, it's not going. You know, I, I I use it in conjunction with everything else that's going on in the farm. You know, the growth rates, how well the lambs look, but it will give me an indication to the worm burdens. It'll give me an indication. You know, is there heavy parasite burdens there? Do I need to drench? Do I not drench? But also, and possibly more importantly, it will be able, it's a tool to help me know how well a drench has worked on my farm. So if you have a query, if you think, oh, I'm not sure that's doing that job, I don't know if that drench worked, it's very, very useful to lift a dung sample pre-drenching and a dung sample post-drenching. There'll be a certain amount of days delay, depending on the drench you use, and that will give you a really good indication to, to how well your drench has worked and the efficacy of it. So there is huge potential in using these tools on farm. If you're in a BDG group and have any queries about this, please do get in touch with your local advisor because um, they will all be able to sort of help you and support you and guide you as to where you would need if you want information on um, SCOPS or the FEC pack. So guys, I suppose maybe then just to sort of summarize and bring a few things up to, uh, together, um, plan your first rotation. I know we've already been through it, but if you're in a situation now and you think, oh my goodness, I've got no grass, you know, how did I not have enough grass for this? It's possibly a lot to do with what you've done over the winter. So think about your rotation, you know, and try and get into that rotation as soon as possible. Quality, not quantity. It is so important. Get those lambs, those sheep and lambs into nice, short, dense, um, sort of high nutritional value pastures. Know what grass you have on farm, walk your paddocks, walk your fields, use your welly, use a sports stick, a plate meter, you know, get out there. Um, set pre and post targets and stick to them. We're probably very good at setting ourselves targets in, right, this is what I'm going to do. And we get a bad day or we get a bad week or the weather doesn't play a ball with us and, and we don't stick to it. But try to stick to it because if you set those targets, that's how you're going to maximize. You're giving the grass the best potential to perform and monitor. You know, we 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 will never know what we're doing unless we're monitoring it. So check your growth, check your live work gains, check how well your animals are growing, and then also parasites. Um, the best plans in the world, the best grazing plan, the best you know sort of you know genetics and breeding program will all go to the wall if you have got um health issues. So Senna, I know that was a bit of a a bit of a world one, but hopefully that gives people a bit of a feel for um what we're doing at the Beef and Sheep Centre, um, and if anybody has any questions, I'll hopefully try and answer them. Thank you very much, Eileen. I think it's just my one slide, Eileen, just to yep. pass on. Yeah, folks, thank you very much, Eileen, and I really appreciate that, and I'd say we've, we've hopefully a good few questions coming in here. But just to, to wrap up this section, folks, before I hand back to Hannah, um, just a few take-home messages, and I'm going to leave the last one with Roy there. Um, as as Aaron has, has said the whole way through, you know, you need to grow and graze only leafy grass. Anything else than that there, and you're losing performance. Ideally, measure your grass regularly. You know, ideally every week at least. Um, walk your fields, know what's happening um in front of you. And if there is something, if it's not as much as you want or you've too much, you know, you know, you have a chance then to take take action. And the last point there, Roy, maybe just leave it to yourself. Yeah, well, we started off in a small way and um, we've rolled that out over the whole farm now. And certainly it takes a bit of effort, but we feel it's well worth while and it's something that you should give it a go and um, hopefully it'll work out for you. And um, certainly it's been a success for us. Thank you very much, Roy. And uh, thank you very much, Eileen. And uh, we'll hand back over to Hannah. Great, Senan. Thank you very much. So, folks, we're going to move to our panel, um, Roy and Marlon, Eileen and Kieran, and thanks to everybody who has sent in um, their questions. Um, Roy and Marlon, I'll just start with yourselves. Um, 
What was the first step that you just took to set up your, your paddock raising system? How did you just get started? Well, the first thing we done anyway, we convinced ourselves it was a good idea and that got us off. And um, first of all, we started um, doing a, maybe two or three fields just to see how it would go and see that we, the sheep would stay where we want them to stay, etc. And um, we rolled that out then in 2020. And again, this year, it's, um, all our fields are divided into paddocks. Um, it, we initially, I mean, done a very cheap system just with battery and electric fencer and bought some posts and a bit of wire and off we went. So we didn't know a lot of expense. And we also um, just used a water cube with a self-filled drinking bowl on the side of it and just moved it from paddock to paddock. So we started off on a small scale and built that up. That's great, Roy. Thank you very much. Could I also just while I have you get a wee comment from you on the size of your paddocks and uh, the batches of sheep that you run in terms of numbers? Um, we would be running around 70 to 80 ewes in a batch and the paddock size would vary sort of around two and a half to three acres, depending on the size of the field and how they're divided up. And um, generally, we would be trying to move them around every three days, it might be every two and a half days, it might be three and a half days, just depending on the size of the field, really, and the size of the paddocks. That's great. Thank you very much. Eileen, I'm going to come to you now. Um, you mentioned in your presentation, Eileen, that um, the Caffrey sheep farm has a slightly higher stocking rate at 16 euros to the hectare. Is that more likely to um, create a higher parasite or worm burden on the farm? Yes, Hannah. Unfortunately, um, yes. So the joys of, I suppose, of a high stocking density. When you have a high stocking density, you're ultimately going to feel the pressures of parasite burdens. Um, you know, previously what we have done, we've always sort of had a policy, we're not going to keep the ewes there any longer than three years. But then we felt, you know, that's possibly a luxury. If you're in a mixed species farm, you can move them. So the, the paddock where the ewes are at now, the, the area where the ewes are at now, they've actually been there since 2015. And we felt that sort of mimics better a sheep on the farm and the pressures that they're under. So yes, there definitely will be higher issues with parasite burdens. And that's why we feel we're leaning heavily on tools like spec pack to monitor our worm burdens and make sure that we're actually, you know, we're drenching when we need to. Um, we're not trying to we're not necessarily saying that we're trying to save drenching you know it's important to use it responsibly and target and make sure that we're getting them and also um making sure you're targeting the right drench for worms but no parasites is definitely an issue that we're you know um that we have to think about and that's why we have to utilize all the tools that we have available to us that's great eileen thank you very much kieran i'm just going to take you in there um for farmers who might have smaller grazing blocks out farms heavier land systems like that um, maybe where paddocks are not as well suited. What options are there for, for farmers on those types of systems? Uh, well, look, at there's always a couple of options. Everybody has options somewhere along the line. So I suppose, like, look at the setup of the field, but like what Roy talked about uh, earlier on. First thing is, could the field just simply be split in two? Once, one fence down the middle, put the sheep back and forward, say, every week to 10 days, fresh grass somewhere. We're always getting fresh grass at some point. Uh, next step up then, if, if, if you can't do that or if you don't think that's suitable till you, that's more a set stocking situation, can you hook on the topper or more, come in and cut out half the field or a third of the field, come back in and do the same again 10 to 12 days later, and encourage the fresh regrowth coming through and control the grass ahead of you? Depending on the soil type, but at peak growth, maybe through May, June, and into July, can you increase the stocking pressure so that you're keeping on top of the grass as much as you can do? getting less stem in the, in the build up the sword and maybe a bit upland ground like uh, heavier ground can you bring in a few cows a bit of mixed grazing they'll break up the, the rougher grass say or there's a bit of heather there and that'll leave a bit more fresh grass coming in the regrowth for the yews that they utilize as well that's lovely kieran thank you very much ryan marlin i'm going to come back to your cells um just a question in here on your fertilizer are you blanket spreading or are you uh, following the yews on individual paddocks when it comes to fertilizer start off in the springtime um we start off in the springtime generally with a bag of your or something equivalent to that and that would be spread throughout the whole farm and then after that then we would um usually um Fertilize on paddocks, every other paddock. You know, we would we'd skip a, a run and we would we'd only be fertilizing them every other time. And also, we try and do maybe two paddocks together 
rather than going out and sort of doing every single paddock. So we'd end up um, probably putting fertilizer on every five or six days um, throughout the year. Um, but it's, I mean, it works okay for us, but it probably does mean having to fertilize more regularly than you would have in a set stocking situation, but it's not hard to do. That's great. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Eileen, coming to you again there, just a question that's in. So when setting up your mobs of sheep in a paddock grazing system, could you see any benefit from separating ewes with single lambs from ewes with double lambs, and pushing those singles for an earlier market, uh, and winning those single lambs and using those ewes to clean up as followers in the grazing system? Okay, thank you, Hannah. That's somebody who's serious about managing grass and utilizing, isn't it? Um, yes and no. I would say initially, you know, especially that first six weeks when, when we're when we're setting up a demand for grass, especially the first sort of six to eight weeks, we're sort of setting up the sheep as a unit. We're allowing that, you know, 2.5 kilograms of dry matter. So I would say for the first six to eight weeks, it's the benefits possibly not there. However, as you move on, especially if you're in a very, you know, tight system and you're, and you're tight for grass, there possibly is a, is a benefit. Um, if you can if you can manage it, you know, it, it, there, there's difficulties and you know there's an extra sort of addition to manage that system but as you move on as the lambs get that wee bit older there possibly is a benefit in there to get those lambs off grass that wee bit quicker um and utilize you know so almost you have three sort of systems there you have your single lambs ahead of your doubles and then those extra years are coming behind so i would say post six to eight weeks um or even if you say sort of a, a cut off figure about eight weeks whenever lambs are starting to really grow from grass there's possibly benefit of there but prior to that i would say not not overly beneficial that's lovely, Eileen. Thanks very much. Kieran. I'm just going to come back to yourself for one final question. Obviously, it's been mentioned a couple of times tonight, this is a, a much more difficult um, grazing year than, than maybe the previous spring, but I suppose possibly you could say grazing is easy when the weather is dry. What about if we have a wet summer or a wet back end, a cold, cold spring, such as what we're having at the minute? Um, what kind of system or what kind of options do we need to be looking at there to manage that? Well, this is where a lot of people would try go try and set up paddocks fall down because number one, they try and do too much too soon and they run into problems like this year, like this spring, and they can't provide enough grass to fill the stock. So that's why it's always important to start small, get your confidence right, because spring is different from the summer, summer is different from the autumn. And you have to learn how to manage grass right throughout the year when you come from the shortage to the def or the surpluses into the deficits and back to the late end. So this year, look, be a bit more flexible. Uh, maybe double up your paddock sizes if you can do. Um, if you've got paddocks down, maybe two acres. If it's a temporary fence, can the temporary wire brought brought down to give maybe that third day, that extra extra days grazing on a paddock. The other thing I'd say as well is, a bit like what Eileen said, can you spread them out a bit more over the farm uh, and ease the grazing pressure, possibly in the older swords, particularly in the older swords or the heavier grade. There's also the option that, although you can say this to a farmer, it'd take your mad in the head. Once you have your sheep trained the electric wire, it needs to be bringing about the, uh, the silage ground into the rotation, strip and it, and, and strip and it. That is the key to it because you're, you're leaving maybe 80%, 75% of the of the silage ward untouched that can be closed off when grass does come back. So those are the things that just be flexible. Uh, Look at your early winning, pull the lambs off, reduce the demand, put the put the dry yews, stack them on top of one another nearly on, on as bare ground as you can do coming into the summertime if it's wet. And just basically, if needs be in the end up, push in a bit of meal if need to get the final few lambs away or get lambs away a bit quicker than normal. It'll always be flexible, that's the thing. It'll change as the year goes on and you have to learn with it. And that's why it's important to start small, expand it out over the years. Great, Kieran. Thank you very much. Folks, I'm going to leave the last question of the night with Roy and Marlon. Um, just a, a comment. Was there anything, folks, with your paddock grazing system that maybe didn't work for you? Was there any changes that you made um, when you started out in, in paddock grazing? The things that didn't work, did you just drop them or did you maybe make some changes to, to try and get them to work? Well, one of the difficulties, I suppose, that we um, maybe had this year especially in a larger field that was divided, it was shelter for the lambs. So we had to select paddocks maybe in more difficult conditions that would um, give shelter for the, the lambs, you know. So that was just one of the things that we came across. Like there's edges around the field, but not out in the middle. 
and um, we would had issues where dams were made in the middle of it, we'd have more issues with maybe pneumonia or whatever because there was nowhere for the dams to go to. But um, it's a matter of selecting feeds and selecting paddocks that are more suitable maybe at that time of the year to suit uh, the conditions. Uh, taking that, like we're quite high up and quite exposed in some of the fields, so that's maybe more important in our situation maybe than some of the land situations. That's great. Yeah. Thank you very much, Roy and Marlon. Thank you. Folks, I think we leave it there. I'm just conscious of time um, this evening. So that brings us to uh, the end of our, our event. I want to thank the panel um, from some really excellent answers there. And I hope that you found the event very informative. If you are a BDG member and you have any further questions on any of the topics that was raised tonight, please contact your local um, CAFRI advisor. If you have any questions in relation to the Northern Irish Northern Ireland Sheep Programme, apologies, please contact either Graham Campbell, Sennan or Darren Carty. There will be a seventh event taking place um, sometime in July and further details of that will become available in the near future. Finally, I just want to thank everybody involved in the event tonight for their help and their support in the preparation and the delivery of the event. Thanks for joining us tonight and we hope to see you again in the future.